Good evening, campers, dreamers, and babysitters. In a world where nobody speaks, a devout female-led community hunts down a young woman who has escaped imprisonment. Recaptured, Azrael is due to be sacrificed to an ancient evil in the wilderness, but fights for her own survival. Yes, folks, this is our raw reaction review for Azrael. Well, Luke, another month, another new offering from the folks over at Shudder and IFC. Yes, uh, they've been just so constant this year. I think we say it just about every time we have an, inter or an interview or review with them. Uh, but yeah, this was one I was quite looking forward to. I didn't know much about it, but uh, back when I believe it was the Sundance Film Festival earlier this year, uh, it was this and Kaku and all these other films that were just getting all of this praise and everything from uh, the audiences there. And then we didn't get a trailer. We didn't get anything for Azrael until recently. And that's when we found out that it was picked up by IFC and, of course, Shudder. And this is going to be premiering in theaters on the 27th. So we've gotten a chance to see it. Luke, tell me, how are you feeling? Initial thoughts on Azrael. You know, this one was a blind spot for me. Hadn't seen a trailer, didn't even know the concept. I uh, read the brief little synopsis right before I hopped onto the film. Um, so, you know, going in, it was a real short turnaround, knowing that kind of that brief concept and realizing that, hey, we're not really talking <laughs> in this movie, mm -hmm. um, which I thought was an interesting uh, concept. You know, it, it's really hard to uh, push a narrative when you're taking out one of those big storytelling techniques that we use. So, you know, I was intrigued to see how they were going to accomplish that. And I'll say, I think going into the film as you're watching it, you're very aware that they're not speaking. I think, you know, conceptually, there are some ideas in here that are not fully actual actualized through the audience's lens just because, you know, I think it may take a couple extra viewings to really connect some dots or you may never connect those dots. I don't know. Um, I certainly have some questions, but I got to say for what they do offer, I think this was um, somewhat satisfying. It leaves you, I think, wanting a little bit more, wanting a little bit more explanation or opening up the world a little bit. But I think overall I was rather satisfied with it. Awesome. Yeah. You know, for me, this was, again, uh, my most anticipated of the uh pretty much the month uh since i started doing those lists at the beginning of every month i have to kind of get them in some sort of an order to discuss and this one just intrigued me the most you know i i was interested in substance but i didn't know much about substance like it was just something i saw a trailer for this i was keeping up on so yeah i knew all the concepts i knew everything and i gotta say i was um I had a harder time connecting with this movie than I thought I would. It was kind of a, a an interesting experience sitting down and watching this because, again, I knew that there wasn't going to be any talking if, like, very limited if there was. Um, and, you know, I knew that it was going to be kind of this interesting cult-like story. And I just found myself kind of uh, waiting for, I guess, at least some of a little bit of an explanation as to what the dynamics are and really what's mo what is motivating our characters to do what and why. And I guess with a world with no dialogue, it is very difficult to come off like, I guess in a convincing and easy to follow path uh, for, I guess, kind of a novice director. This was uh, directed by Eli Katz who, um, you know, we were just talking before this. He's only really done in our wheelhouse that we know, uh, a couple of things like um, he did an episode of Swamp Thing and he did uh, The Haunting of Bly Manor. He did an episode there. So I don't know. I just feel like maybe had this been in a more experienced director's hands, they might have found a, a better way visually to kind of get some more information across. Because I really did find myself at the end of the day having a tough time getting sucked into this movie. Yeah, um, you know, going into it, I will say... If you're expecting maybe a pure horror film, I, I don't think this will necessarily 100% uh, you know, satisfy you from that aspect. I think there's a lot of action in this one. Uh, you do get lost in some of the action sequences, I think. Uh, they do present some gore here. Now, in a world of no dialogue and we don't connect every dot, I do like the open-endedness of some of it. I think it does add to the eeriness. There's 
particular instance where we have Samara weaving, um, hiding from something in the shadows, and we just see kind of a silhouette. And I thought that was really, really um, well done in kind of, you know, not knowing exactly what the hell's going on, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I did like that aspect of it. Now, there's a particular instance in here, I will say, that had me struggling, uh, where I, I think it's meant to be meaningful, but as we're recording this review... I've only watched it one time, and reflecting on it, I'm still not 100% sure of what they were saying in there. Um, so I, I don't know if that was something maybe I missed. Maybe it was the lack of dialogue. Um, it was something where, you know, uh, I kind of moved past just because we don't really have time to sit with it um, as we're moving toward, you know, the, the, I guess, third act or the finality of the film. Um, so, you know, I didn't harp on it too long, but I think there are a handful of instances in here where um, certainly dialogue would help kind of facilitate our message, so to speak. But I did enjoy my time with kind of just living in the eeriness with no dialogue. Um, and I will say some of the scenes where we're building from something in the woods, I think those are really well done from a tension perspective and what they do bring and how they kind of how the situations unfold. So I will say looking at this film and living in those instances of where they're building tension, I didn't know where they were going to go next from scene to scene. Yeah. And I, I can say, you know, coming in a little bit lukewarm on this one, I agree. I think that the horror um, and some of those sequences were really well done, uh, especially a lot of the effects and the gore in this. There's a lot of practical stuff in use here. And they do a great job with it. Hell, even some of the action, there's a particular scene where two characters are kind of fighting on the ground and uh, there's a weapon at play there. And the way that kind of ends, it, it does almost feel like you're watching John Wick for a second there. Uh, but I, I mean that in a very good way. I don't mean that in a bad way. It, it's, it is in line with the story that we're telling. But I do want to say that I think that not getting as much of an explanation on the horror was not my issue really i i think that that's definitely all good there but what again once we kind of get into our more human antagonists i just i need to know a little bit more about what's the dynamic other than samara weaving good everybody else bad you know what i mean like i just i i had a hard time really understanding what exactly their beef was with her and i thought you know we'd at least get some kind of visual like representation uh of some sort um i thought you know there might be some angle at play here that uh, they would at least go into a little bit and and i just found that to kind of make the more human antagonists a little bit more like just too soft in my opinion to one note just kind of there to die which uh, i i wasn't super pleased with but i think overall the performances though um were really strong i mean like with what they don't have at their disposal with dialogue there's a lot of emoting. There's a lot of emotion, a lot of tension, like Luke was saying, that gets built through that. And I think, again, Samara Weaving, she's one of my favorites, and she absolutely crushes here. I really liked her performance. Um, there's a another gentleman who plays the character of Luther named uh, Iro Milano, Milanov. Uh, I liked him a lot. He's very creepy, uh, very interesting-looking fella. And uh, I, I enjoyed a lot of their dynamic and kind of... Uh, where he went into, he definitely has the uh, most effective scene, I would say, in the film. Um, and yeah, I, I think there's still a lot to love here, but I could easily see people walking into this movie not knowing anything, not knowing that there's no dialogue in here, and being thoroughly confused for most of the film. Yeah, it, it's going to want you to connect some dots and kind of just live in the situation where... I'll say I didn't I don't think I struggled with that idea maybe as much as you did in terms of kind of not having that strong narrative connective tissue with our characters. This is really more so kind of the audience being dropped in a situation that something has clearly happened and um, we have two opposing forces and then I guess this other third opposing force uh, coming in and you know kind of trying to dance around that situation of um, hey, these, this, this human hates this human, and then there's something else here that is hates everybody. You know, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have a... It's not holding a grudge. So, you know, looking at that, I think 
for me, I didn't need too much of a backstory in that instance because we are living in that situation. We don't necessarily... This movie, it moves, where we don't really have that time to sit too much. Now, there is kind of um, some sort of motivation for Smaller Weaving's character uh, to a certain extent of, you know, uh, sticking around in trying to uh, achieve something. Um, so you kind of get a connective tissue there as to why she's still sticking around and still dealing with this cult uh so to speak so you know I, I didn't need too much of a backstory i think we're kind of dropped into you know we're not learning anything this isn't um what quiet place day one where you know we we have to learn all those familiar beats and exactly why everything's happening this is very much the audience as we're being brought in we're far removed from whatever the situation was and how the world looks now in post-apocalyptic scenario i guess um, so, you know, I didn't struggle with that as much. Um, Samara Weaving, oh my gosh, you know, I love that she's taking these roles here where, you know, no dialogue. That's going to be such a, a task in itself as an actor to be like, we're taking that medium completely out of here. So just evoke emotion for the entire situation. And, you know, from what we're dealing with from one scene to the next, it has to be slightly different to keep the audience intrigued. One of my issues with the film it did feel slightly redundant i guess in a sense where it i wish you would have expanded the world maybe changed the scenery for me a little bit where this is primarily outside you know it's out in the woods um so it it kind of the scenery once you've seen a few scenes of it it seems like you've seen a majority of it as we move into the third act i think it does vary to a certain extent but you know through that first two acts i think you know we're kind of seeing the same scenery over and over for me uh but you know it, it didn't kill the film for me i think i had some fun with this i think they it, they implement some interesting ideas uh there's one confined scenario with samara weaving's character that i thought was rather really well done especially the um the sound design there uh really oh, did yeah. hit for me um so i think there's a lot to love about this film i think going into it if you're on a hype train for this film you may be left a little underwhelmed from what they present again i didn't see the trailer so i wasn't really excited about this one i was intrigued that samara weaving was in it and then finding out that there was no dialogue i think you know that is such an interesting driving force for an hour and i think what hour 20 hour 25 i can't yeah, remember it's how long. not so very it was, long um, it doesn't take much so, you know, for me, I think I sit with this one at a recommend. I think this is a solid recommend for me. Um, I think, you know, some people can have fun for it, fun with it, but I think going in as, you know, a deep gore hound, blood thirsty horror fan, you may um, not necessarily get everything that you want, especially if you want some deeper narrative. I don't think you're going to get it here, though. Yeah, I will definitely second what you were saying about tension and just some of the shots in here. I thought that they did an excellent job, not only from a visual standpoint, but from just the way they were able to build tension. And the cinematography is really great. I mean, like I think about the final few shots of this film, uh, especially just like with what we're seeing and just kind of what the implications are. And I just think that's it's breathtaking. It is really kind of folk horror, like just exposure like like overexposure i love it so much um and you know i just wish that i i found myself connecting with the movie a little bit more i i would definitely say that this isn't something that i'm gonna shy away from by any means i'd probably end up watching it again just to see if maybe i i get a little bit more of it uh because you know this has happened to me in the past with movies like the ritual which was one that uh wasn't big on the first time i saw it you know actually i was a little bit more harsher with that one but found myself coming back to it years and years later and loved it. So this one could very much end up there. Plus, I mean, this I do want to give props to Simon Barrett. Although there's not a lot of dialogue here, he is someone who just comes up with very interesting horror concepts. And I absolutely uh, love his work. And uh, I will, I guess, mention now that right after this review, you're going to be seeing a quick interview that I did with him. So I'm not just saying I love his work because I'm talking to him. I, I really do. If you go back and watch our videos, you'll see I praise the guest. The guest is an amazing fucking film. Um, but this one, yeah, I, I got to be honest here. I was a little, uh, little perturbed by a few things. Didn't quite connect with it as much as I wanted to. So I still think this is worth checking out. So I'm going to give this worth a watch and definitely... I think seeing Luke and I on a split basis here, very rare does this happen. Uh, I think that uh, the best thing you can do is check this film out when it drops in theaters or on Shutter later this year and give us your thoughts and opinions. Because, yeah, I think this uh, might divide a few people. So 
like the ideas, like the setting, like most of it, just needed a little bit more meat in there. So, all righty, that's going to wrap it up here for us, guys. So stick around for that interview. But uh, until next time, I'm Dylan Newell. And I'm Luke Janesco. And remember, stay More. scared. What was it like kind of coming up with the trigger for that idea? What was like the kind of initial spark that got you wanting to do a story like Azrael? Yeah, Azrael is kind of a unique project for me because I don't tend to gravitate towards post-apocalyptic stuff. Um, it, but ever since I was a little kid, I wanted to do a movie that had no dialogue. Uh, just because I always loved silent comedies, even like growing up. And um, and I remember I was like, really obsessed with seeing Luc Besson's uh, Le Dernier Combat when I like read that that movie had no dialogue. And then I saw it and, you know, obviously like what you have in your mind doesn't live up to like what's on screen. So then your mind starts kind of working. Um, I, I always say that I tend to take inspiration from films that I'm like slightly disappointed by versus films that I like completely love. Because then you kind of start being like, well, what, what, what would my version of that be? Um, so I, I guess the honest answer is I had that in my head for a while, but the truth is the, this, this is like the first project I think I've done that was based on like dreams that I was having. I kind of had a reoccurring nightmare, um, a few nights in a row, like, like, uh, kind of around the end of 2018. And it was a lot of the details of Azrael. It was just this like, and, and in the dream, uh, it was like, this is like a vision of the future. It was like the John Carpenter's Prince of Darkness thing, where like, this is not a dream you're seeing. It. And, I, and I'd wake up and I'd say, oh, I got to write that down, um, which is especially funny because I'm not a particularly religious person. Um, and Azrael is, is, you know, a religious mythology for sure. Um, so, yeah, so I had I, I like like I rarely have recurring nightmares and I rarely have recurring nightmares that don't star myself. But I did kind of have this like. I kind of downloaded parts of this and then I was just like, well, I, I gotta, I guess I gotta write that down. Um, and then, you know, and then, um, you know, Evan Katz was the first person I showed the script to back when it was only like 48 pages long. Cause you know, I think Fede Alvarez told me that the don't breathe script was something like 60 pages. And that, that kind of gave me the confidence to be like, like, no, this is a movie. <laughs> It might, it might be a slightly yeah. like short one, but this is like a fee. I know this like, like, like the way we're going to do this, it will be like a feature. Um, so, and, you know, and, 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 uh, and then once our producer, Dan Kagan came on board, like suddenly, you know, people started taking it seriously, but, you know, up until then, I think um, I wasn't sure what to do with it. You know, I was originally going to direct it myself in a kind of experimental video way, maybe like similar to how Ty West did like Trigger Man with like mm -hmm. really long, tedious, like unbroken shots that like, that, but but then nonetheless build a certain kind of suspense. I'm always kind of fascinated by movies that can like use, you know, a lull in pacing to really get you. Um, and so that was kind of my original vision, but but after doing VHS 94, I'd, I kind of lost my appetite for like long unbroken take action, though I ended up doing a bit of second unit stuff on this. So Evan did let me do that, a little bit of that again. But um but yeah, then that's when Evan was kind of like, well, how would you feel about me directing? I'd be like, that'd be the best of both worlds. You know, the movie gets made the way I want it to be made, but I don't have to do any work. Um, yeah. I ended up having to do a little bit of work, uh, but Ev not as much as Evan. One of the uh, elements that I, I thought was really impressive just from like a creative standpoint was the inflammation of these uh, almost like burn victim-esque creatures. And mm -hmm. like, where does, uh, where does that kind of, uh, come from was that something that was a part of your nightmares or was that something that you know you guys kind of formed like was there always going to be these creatures involved or was it more centered around this cult or this community no they were definitely part of my nightmares and and dan martin our special effects guy who's, who's a really great guy who did like possessor and bo the borderlands and stuff he really uh ultimately nailed it uh i love the way they look um mm -hmm. the, the awful makeup appliance for those poor actors <laughs> uh you know in second unit i got like the bad burn person suit that had a big zipper in the back that you know, oh, wow. like to go there. so yeah I'm, I'm ruining the scares now uh so i shouldn't talk <laughs> anymore about actually making the film until i'll save it for the commentary track but um yeah like like you know it, it's hard right like like to think of like a new kind of creature or a new like thing to scare people with um but, you know, an interesting thing about, like, kind of rapture stories is this notion of, like, like the earth being kind of scorched a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. And, and like, like, the idea that some people kind of would survive the fires in a certain way and be left kind of something else. 
was I think like our original kind of notion of that. And then we, you know, but we didn't want to, um, you know, we knew we didn't want to fall into the traps of like a lot of like creatures in the woods films, just because, you know, quite honestly, we didn't have a huge budget to outdo a lot of those movies. So we had to be kind of creative with the way we were scaring people. And I think at an early stage, um, you know, in the script, it kind of always indicated that the burnt people were uh, like a little bit pathetic, uh, which is kind of where the scares came from. They're like a little bit clumsy. And I think we watched, uh, I, I showed Evan and Dan a little bit of a Attack on Titan, the anime, like how the people, yeah. have, like how the Titans, it feels like they can't really control their bodies and like their lower bodies are moving faster than their upper bodies and stuff. And and we took a lot of inspiration from from that anime and 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 how the motion of, of the Titans looks. Um, I, you know, that's a show that's obviously influencing a lot of people. It's, it's probably boring to reference at this point, but, you know, but, but again, like it was like, you know, just trying to find a way for them to move that didn't feel like Return of the Living Dead, but also didn't feel like Night of the Living Dead. <laughs> you know, you have to find that like, yeah, you have to find kind of a new place. So, so we, you know, the truth is we have a very like elaborate mythology for the burn people but you know as you said kind of part of the fun of this is is or i would say like the to the extent that like people who are really enjoying asriel tend to be enjoying that it doesn't totally explain everything but that there is a coherent logic like it doesn't just feel like we're throwing a bunch of things at you and we didn't bother to figure them out ourselves um i like to think this anyway um, so <laughs> you know but that's but you know but also you know some people i'm not anti-exposition uh, if you saw Godzilla Kong, the new empire, I think, uh, I, you know, no one would accuse me of never having written like any exposition. Um, I think it has a place, but I do think also as a viewer, I like movies that surprise me and intrigue me and have me kind of like not knowing what's going to come next. Um, and I hope, I hope that Asriel delivers that for people. Yeah. <laughs> I only have a, a minute or two left, so I kind of have uh, to pick my poison here. Cause I do want to yeah. ask you about the difference between like, you know, working with, uh, on a project like uh, Godzilla X Kong um, and those films and how massive they are when it comes to the writing process there and versus something like this. But I think what I have to lean on here just because I am such a massive fan of it is the guest. I, I am obsessed with that film. Uh, I think it, it's seriously one of the, the best outputs that you guys have done together. And I think that uh, my biggest question has always been, I know you probably can't answer too much of this, but like there was always word of, there was going to be a sequel or there was going to be some kind of a follow-up for that film. Is that still ever percolating in your brain? Do you ever think about going back to that world and telling more of that story? Or do you think that you've kind of, uh, you know, moved past that at least for now? No, I mean, Adam never lets me forget it. Uh, Cause I, you know, I'll be honest, you know, like I, I have really a lot of trepidation about the idea of making a sequel. I and mean, for one thing, I, you know, I don't think this is like a spoiler or anything because we'll have to do something different now, but our original sequel concept did involve Lance Reddick, who very tragically is no longer with us. And so just that alone makes me feel kind of like, oh, I don't know if it would be right, you know? And then secondarily, like, look, when The Guest came out, we all, Adam and I thought we'd screwed up our careers so badly that we like instantly pivoted to like a Blair Witch sequel that we thought was like a straightforward success. Um, you know, five, 10 years later, I'm here, or 10 years later, more specifically, I'm here in Austin at Fantastic Fest for, you know, the 10 year anniversary of the guest for the new 4K DCP. And it's immensely gratifying to have that fan base. And I don't want to do anything to spoil that or ruin it which is why we did like the guest two soundtrack album. Cause it was kind of like, here's something fun that kind of like gives you a hint mm -hmm. of what we were thinking, but I'm, I'm really hesitant at the same time. I'll never say never. Cause we love working with Dan Stevens. We love working with Micah Monroe, yeah. like, and, and it's a world that like, you know, we, we love exploring, you know? Uh, so it's hard for me to say never. And, and I, you know, there's, there's been a lot of discussion of like different things that a guest sequel could be like, you know, whether it's a feature film or something else, um, and, and to a certain extent, it's, it's just about kind of finding the right time to like really sit down with Adam and like really like talk about what it is. But I also admit I'm, I'm scared, you know, we made a movie that, that people didn't like, and now suddenly they do like it. And what if we make a sequel that's not as good as what people have in their imagination now, you know, it's that, it's that prequel conundrum of like, when you show me a prequel, it's like, oh yeah, that's kind of how I pictured, you know, like Darth Vader kind of came about, but I, I guess I pictured it being like a little bit cooler, you know, I know that's not in vogue now to hate on the prequels, but I'm an old man. So, you know, I, I I'm still, I'm still, <laughs> no, caught, I'm still caught, I'm still caught up in that reality. 
So, you know, but it's true. It's, it's like, now I'm competing with your imagination now. And like, that's tough. I like, when I did the guest, I wasn't competing with anything. People saw it and they're like, oh, that's good. But now they like, they have an idea of what the guest two should be. And I almost would rather that just like, I almost rather say whatever you think a guest sequel could be, it's probably better than what I would come up with. So I was for now. Let's leave it at that. that. <laughs> the horse shit gonna do it live. Put splatter cast ticket every day they lie. Splatter cast, 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 splatter